It's a pleasure to be with you, church. My name is Pastor Travis Hoban. I'm so excited to be able to share God's Word with, with you this week. We are in time period number five of our series on church history called Throwback. And it's an exciting time in history because there are start, there's starting to be some challenges to the church. And I want to just fill you in real quick on the past few uh, time periods that we've covered so far, the first four time periods. But before we do that, I want to continue to always read the verse that is from Matthew 16, verse 18. And it says this, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There is a prevailing church that we see over and over uh, that, we'll, that we continue to see rise to the occasion in all these different time periods. And so time period one was the early church. We see the birth of the church, the day of Pentecost. We see the foundation of the church with the apostles teaching. We see the persecution of the church just as soon as it starts. Persecution starts to happen. Time period two, we see from 325 to 590, which is the church councils, the creeds, and the canon. God's Word is finally formed together, the New Testament and Old Testament, to form what we have in our hands today known as the Bible. Many different translations, but uh, all God's Word. And so time period three it was the elusive church, which is 590 A.D. to 1517 A.D., there's an Islamic uprising. That's the challenge of Islam. There's the great schism, the separation of the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. And then there's the power of the Roman Catholic Church that begins to uh, come and corrupt its leadership. And last week, uh, we covered the emboldened church. Uh, the one that is emboldened by the Reformers, Protestant Reformation, where we learned that great what, what the Bible has taught in many, many different ways, but that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And those that are saved by grace, through faith in Christ, live their lives on Scripture uh, alone as, a, as an authority and for the glory of God alone. And then at the last two parts of time period four was the Catholic Counter-Reformation where the Catholic Church dug in its heels and says, hey, we're not going to reform, we're not going to change things, which brings us to the last part of last week, which is the 30 years war, a uh, thing that did not have to happen, but happened because... Uh, people uh, began to fight against each other and a lot of lives were lost uh, and that, that didn't have to be. And so that is the end of time period four. And this time period uh, five is known as the enlightened church. Okay, the age of enlightenment, also known as the age of reason. And I want to share a story with you real quick. I know we've had a lot of information at the beginning. I remember being a college student. I grew up in a pastor's, a pastor's kid. Went to college, and I remember sitting in one of my first classrooms in community college as a freshman at 19 years old. And a religion professor started in on some interesting ideas. He started on some interesting ideas about God and how all religions lead to God. And I remember thinking, well, I've never really heard this before. I grew up a pastor's kid in a Christian home, and that wasn't what I was taught. And then he said, these, all these types of things, you can, you can actually be your own God. You can actually have your own and enjoy your own glory as God. I remember these ideas really did not sit well, but then I began to see others in my class that actually believed these kind of things. And it didn't matter the way they lived their lives. It didn't matter whether they believed in Jesus or not because everything was going to be okay. And what was the reason why? Well, that's just what they thought. They began to reason and they began to think, well, that's just the way that it is. And I'm here to tell you, church, that's not the way it is. There is reason and there is faith. And I'm here to tell you tonight, in the age of reason, we start to see this concept of uh, reason being in conflict with the revealed Word of God. Reason and revelation being in opposition to one another. And tonight, as we talk about the age of lightman and the age of reason, I want you to know we can be fair, we can be fairly sure, we're very sure and confident that our reason, our faith is reasonable. We have a reasonable faith. And there's been men like William Lane Craig and Frank Turek, who's become into May in um, coming to Maine in November at the University of Maine, that teach how we have a reasonable faith through apologetics. And so as we dive into the age of enlightenment. The age of reason or the age of enlightenment, those words are synonymous. Um, there is three major areas 
uh, that were uh, that were um, were very affected by this age of reason. And the first one is philosophy. Okay, and one of the uh, areas in philosophy that began to develop was rationalism. Uh, one of the major philosophical developments uh, was by uh, Rene Descartes, who introduced rationalism into philosophical thought. Okay, philosophy is like your framework of how you view life and the world, and so he started to uh, put in his thoughts. and Descartes worked, encouraged other, worked, and encouraged other thinkers to question long-standing cultural assumptions as well as their own presuppositions. The predominant theme of rationalism is that concepts and knowledge can be gained independent, independently of sense experience. We can think our way to truth. Now, we know that just because we think something doesn't make it true. I can think all that I want that I'm a bird and want to fly, but I will be sadly disappointed if I try to do that off the top of my house. Okay, We can think all that we want and in our senses uh, we can have we have natural things that we take in, but reason alone doesn't necessarily equal real truth. Okay, so rationalism began to pop up. The other thing that happened in the philosophical framework of the Enlightenment was empiricism. So empirical data. These are the people. Maybe you're like this. Don't tell me your feelings. I want to know the facts. Okay, so you have reason, and then facts come into play. Empiricism. Empir Empiricism, partly in response to rationalism and partly of its own accord, empiricism also developed during the Enlightenment. In contrast to rationalism, um, empiricism holds that knowledge begins with the senses. Okay, so your five senses are what guide you. Francis Bacon planted the seed for empiricist thought that came to fruition in the physics of Isaac Newton. Since natural science begins with observation through the senses, the scientific revolution could not have occurred without this empirical, philosophical underpinning. So it's not just what you think, but it's what you observe, what you take in, what you're able to sense that plays into philosophy. The last thing uh, that happened in the philosophical development of the age of reason is skepticism. Okay, so skepticism came because of David Hume. He famously spread doubt about whether knowledge could be attained at all from all the senses or from reason. Hume, David Hume's conclusions led down a road that results in, at best, only probabilistic reasoning to possible conclusions. And so Hume was a skeptic. Uh, I think some of us have skepticism that we deal with on a regular basis. I know that at one point in my life, I was very skeptical about my faith and the Lord continued to work in my life and put people around me to help me with that. But folks, we have a rational faith. We do. Here's the next area. Of, of development, the age of reason and enlightenment. And that's in the area of science. Isaac Newton comes along and he puts out this great work called Principia Mathematica. And in this work, Newton sets the tone for a mechanic understanding of the natural world by explaining a wide range of phenomena via mathematical formulas. Given that the things previously thought to be unquantifiable or unpredictable in nature could, under Newton's system, be understood in terms of a machine-like entity okay and oh by the way isaac newton in his free time invented calculus just saying smart guy so in the area of science that was the second major area of development in the enlightenment era and then uh, the third major area is in politics there's a man named john locke that was tremendously important uh, a political philosopher during the enlightenment many of his ideas and principles were studied and adopted by the founders of america and are evident in documents like the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Locke emphasized the natural freedom of human beings, the equality of all before God, natural law, and the government by consent of the governed. Here's funny, something interesting about John Locke. He actually believed and justified the overthrow of the government when it fails. If we think we have a throne government, I wouldn't trying to overthrow it right now might not be a good idea, but it's one of those things that was in his thought process. He was key in some of the ideas of the people that wrote our founding documents, the founding fathers that said we have these certain inalienable rights, things that are given to us by God that have intrinsic value. People have intrinsic value. And so the Age of Enlightenment began to reason and rationalize certain things. They would challenge because they said, I can't sense, taste, smell, touch God, so therefore He doesn't exist. So they started to rationalize spiritual things. 
And I know that people uh, from for ages have said, well, we can't see God. And that's part of the Christianity, the Christian life that is somewhat challenging is because we have an invisible God, but that we have a relationship with and we live our lives for. And it's a faith-based relationship. But our faith does not need to be separated from reason. We can reasonably make rational decisions about faith and the Scriptures are reasonable. I want to give you an example from Acts 17. I'm sure you've heard of these folks before. The Bereans. Acts 17, verses 11 and 12 says this, Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. I'm going to break this down for you a little bit. The Berean Jews did not have the New Testament. They had probably some letters and knew who Paul was and that he wrote these letters. They just had the Old Testament. But the Bereans received the message eagerly. The Bereans examined the message daily, is what it says. And the Bereans believed the message corporately with some of the other Greeks in the area. And so they received Paul's teaching. Paul comes to them and teaches them. They receive this teaching, but they examine it. And they examine it corporately. They come together and they reason, and then they compare what Paul says with the Scripture and what naturally is in the senses, what is in their minds, is that what they're thinking about. They come together and they understand that it's revelation from God, but it's also reason that helps us understand that. And it's a very important connection that we have here. We have a reasonable faith, folks. We have a reasonable faith. Don't let anybody tell you science has disproved the Bible. Uh, science doesn't tell us anything. Scientists do. Science is fact-based. It's empirical data. And we have scientists that interpret that data. And when an interpretation is made that is biased, it can give us biased information. And so, we have a very reasonable faith. We don't need to lack in confidence and put our academic side or our understanding in school in one side of our life and then when we come to church we open up the spiritual and we say no the academic side stays over there that's reserved for academia no we need to embrace these things like the bereans reason compare scripture with scripture when when i'm teaching like this i want to encourage everybody reasonably seek after god and go through and read these texts as you see them on the screen go back and spend time pouring over god's word the Age of Enlightenment really increased this understanding of reason. But here's what happened as a result. Humanism began to creep up. Where it wasn't a God-centered view of the world, it was a man-centered view of the world. And a lot of problems started to come because of that. And so why there's an increase in beautiful art. Bach and Mozart are producing music. And there's Isaac Newton uh, with his with his inventions, discoveries. He says they were all things that God made and He just discovered them. <laughs> okay, But there's all these different things that happen. What happens in that time in the Age of Enlightenment is there is a puffing up in, of the human nature and where humanity is, all, is, is above the position of God where humanity is thought of as supreme. And God, God has a lesser role. And so humanity began to take place, I'm sorry, humanism began to take place in the Enlightenment period, the age of reason. And we still have a lot of that in our culture today. There's a great book called Ideas Have Consequences. And the ideas of, the ideas of that, this time began to infiltrate the culture. And it began to, people began to not be as interested in church because the center of the world was hum humanity. And so they looked to humanism. And so, as a result of that, uh, the next time period is known as the Revival or the Great Awakening. And at this time, religion was becoming just ceremony, just ritualistic, and less personal during this time. Religion was viewed as non-essential and unnecessary by some as scientific discoveries began to be popularized. It was one of those things, you get married at the church, you get buried in the in the graveyard behind the church. It's, just, it's a transactional type of thing is what began to take place. It wasn't a real authentic uh, faith. And Isaac Newton's law of science caused people to view God as less necessary as they interpreted the world being governed by laws of science and not go governed by God. Interesting, 
Interestingly, Isaac Newton did not scorn belief in God. He viewed his findings, and I said this earlier, as discoveries of God's creation and not human invention. He said, these are things that I've just, I've come about and God's allowed me to understand. And so again, there's this elevation of humanity and human thought and idea and discovery as opposed to a supreme creator of the universe that was absolutely involved in the details of man. And so here's a scripture I want to share with you from John 3. It reminds me in the part of John's part of John's disciples, John the Baptist. There's a great line at the end of this that I'm sure you guys have all heard. If you've been in church, you've been listening for a while now. But uh, they were losing followers. John Baptist, is fo- fo- John Baptist, his followers were starting to go with Jesus. Look what he says in John 3, 26 uh, through verse 30. He says this, They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, Remember, John said, look, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Look, He is baptizing and everyone is going to Him. To this, John replied, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of Him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. In some versions it says he must increase. I must decrease. It's a very famous and well-known thing. And so when we understand Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, things begin to, hap- begin to happen. They began to happen in this revival and great awakening time period. I'm going to talk about two major characters that were involved in this. So intellectuals were arguing that people were not just helpless sinners, but were reasonable creatures who just needed knowledge and common sense more than God's grace. You think that might be going around today still? This byproduct was that many, again, many people started to drop out of church at the end of this, the time period of the Enlightenment and into the revival period. But then the stage was set. For Christians to be revived and renewed. And in the late 1720s, a revival began to spring forth. Two main leaders for the first great awakening were Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. And we'll start with Jonathan Edwards first. Um, A New England guy was in Massachusetts, okay? He had this sermon, and there's, there's pictures of it online, and you can read part of the sermon online. It's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It, was not, um, it wasn't very inspirational. Let's just put it that way, okay? It was very much a hellfire and brimstone type of sermon. And he preached it uh, in... Uh, it, there was a response that was very memorable in Enfield, Connecticut uh, in 1741. And it says this in the history books, as people sat in the pews listening to the words of that Edwards spoke, they began to cry and weep so loud that Jonathan Edwards could not even finish his sermon. The pastors went down among those in the congregation and began to pray with them. And so this news of revival as people hearing about uh, repentance and coming to a, the God of grace began to travel around the New England area. By the way, all the Ivy League schools at that time were not these bastions of humanism and thought. They were seminaries. They were Bible schools. They were there to train pastors how to shepherd the flock of God. And how far we've come. Remember, those ideas from even back in the Enlightenment have consequences. Look where the Ivy League schools are at now. Edwards usually preached the tr- at the church he pastored in Northampton, Massachusetts. Other revival preachers of the time would travel all through the colonies. And uh, you, you'll see, if you read anything about the revival, people would go up and down different cities, different towns. They would stay in, uh, in just inns in people's houses, and they would go back and forth, and they would preach, and they would have, a lot of times, would have outdoor services. Okay, and so the next guy I want to tell you about is George Whitfield. Now, I know his name says Whitefield, but it's pronounced Whitfield. And uh, he was a minister from Britain. He played a major role in the Great Awakening. Whitfield toured the colonies up and down the Atlantic coast, preaching his message. In one year, Whitfield covered 5,000 miles in America and preached more than 350 times. Let that sink in for a second. There's 365 days in a year. He preached 350 times. Maybe he doubled up every now and again, but he was very, very active. Remember, this is by horse and buggy that he's traveling, 5,000 miles, okay? His style was charismatic, theatrical, and expressive. Uh, Whitfield 
was uh, he, grew, he grew up in Britain, but he took a ton of acting classes, and that was really his passion. And then he began to meet uh, up with a guy named John Wesley, and they started studying the Bible together. And then they, they said that they were Christians, but they actually, as they read God's Word, realized, yeah, we're not. So they actually were converted together, and they kind of separated away some. But Whitfield was a, was a theater guy, but when God got a hold of his heart, he really took to the stage, but it wasn't for theater. It was to proclaim the Gospel. Uh, Whitfield preached to common people, slaves, the Native Americans, and in his early years, he was not welcome to preach in churches. Imagine that. So he would go to fields or outside of coal mines, and he would preach to those working in the coal mine, and they would be moved by his words. Here's an interesting quote right here. Tears would flow down their dirty faces, making white gutters as their tears would wash away the coal, the coal dust. Whitfield's success convinced English colonists to join local churches and re-energized a once waning Christian faith. The Great Awakening reinvigorated religion at a time when religion was declining. What we see in the American colonies and in, in Europe resembles similar things that we will see in the last days, okay, before the Great uh, Awakening and the Revival. I want to read, to, read something to you from 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful and unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. That's Paul's letter to Timothy. He says, be very, very careful with these types of people. And we see this a lot in our culture today where the self is elevated above the Savior, where my opinion is the guiding force of my life and not the sovereignty of God and the Scriptures to guide us. Uh, we, we see this in our culture today. We see this. People knowing godly things but denying them. They had a form of godliness but denied its power. In fact, the words of John Wesley and George Whitfield uh, brought, many mis brought many ministers in Great Britain to salvation that were not even saved. They were so convicted by their messages. So look into your heart. Today as you're sitting here and online as you're thinking about this, look into your heart. Inspect the current state of your life. To what degree are you living for God and what is the current state of your heart in, the, in your relationship with God. This is exactly the thing that makes the Rock Church want... To, we want to, for you to understand one of the pillars of our ministry here is that we want you to know Jesus. We don't want you to know about Jesus as a historical figure. While that is important that we understand it historically, we want you to know Jesus as your Savior. Last week we talked about uh, how salvation works. It is completely out of our hands. It is by grace, through faith, um, in Christ alone. And that is how we are saved. You feel something different when you're saved. You know something is different. And even when you feel things in your senses, maybe your emotions are raging, or you have these thoughts that can overtake you, you know that you are eternally uh, in God's possession because He has you. Okay? And so we have that power. Have the longings of your restless heart been satisfied? There's a very common phrase that says people have a God-shaped hole in their life. And I want to tell you that God does not have a people-shaped hole in His heart. It is not He needs us. No, we need Him. And a famous preacher, an apologist named R.C. Sproul said that all of our problems, the things that we elevate in our life, the things that we can sometimes be consumed by. He said, they are all theological problems. They're all God-based problems. We may think that our problems are financial or relational or our health, but really all of those things are only problems that God can fix. Okay? I like uh, to think about behavior change. People want to change, you know, Dave Ramsey, the get out of debt guy. And uh, he talks about behavior change all the time and how you can adapt your behavior and behavior change, but he said you have to get it in your head and then in your heart, and then it will start to change. And so this is something the Great Awakening accomplished. The Great Awakening started to happen, and people began to change. 
Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, their preaching took root and it started to really spread and it really started to grow in the U.S. and Great Britain. It happened uh, kind of in, in both places. And like I said, George Whitfield was from Britain, came there and kind of came back and forth. So it was a, it was a huge breakout uh, in this country. When you understand revival, uh, it's, it starts with us. It starts with one person and one person with conviction going about and, and talking about it. And uh, are, do we want revival enough to talk about it? Do we want revival enough to not just not only come to church, which is important, but also be the church and be the hands and feet of Jesus in the, in the community that we are around? I uh, heard a story just just this afternoon, and I won't I won't share any names, but uh, there someone that just was driving by and saw somebody in need, and they just felt like they needed to stop, and they did, and they were able to uh, to minister to someone. And so I'm. Want to just, uh, I just want to say that that's part of revival is when you see a need and you understand that, hey, God's love and my relationship with Him are not only personal, they are deeply relational with other people. So we get that. And so that's how revival begins to work. Okay. Now, we see revival happen. Newer denominations such as uh, the Methodist, the Baptist, there's going to be some others we talk about in a second. Uh, they began to pop up. All right, and then our country. And so while the movement unified uh, the colonies, the Great Awakening, it kind of gave them a sense of independence. Um, church growth experts say it also caused division among those who supported it and those who rejected it. And so we will see the next time period, which is the revolution time period. Uh, and that's the rise of denominationalism and the independence of the United States from Britain. So I'm going to give you just, I know you guys have probably remember this from history class, but Taxation without representation was happening in the colonies. The colonists were not happy. We had something called the Boston Tea Party. If you don't know what that is, just Google it. But there was a lot of dissension between the colonies. There was not a, enough representation in the government. There was too much, too many uh, just really forceful, heavy-handed things going on. And so the United States declares its independence from Britain. There's a Revolutionary War when we gain our independence. And it's a major thing major major thing that happened and then we developed the constitution and actually the constitution a lot of it like i said earlier was influenced by john locke who was a philosopher in the enlightenment in the age of reason and so we see this independence but guess what happens as we separate from the the tyranny in britain we also start to separate as churches began to form denominations and so this is an interesting part of our church history because a lot of people, we talked about the Great Schism, and then there's the Reformation, and there's the Eastern Orthodox. We kind of have not a Great Schism, but a separating of denominations um, in this country. And so I'm just going to go through just a few of the things about the, the denominationalism during that time. The Lutheran uh, denomination was named after Martin Luther and was based on his teachings. The Methodists got their name because their founder, John Wesley, was famous for coming up with methods for spiritual growth. Presbyterians are named for their view on church leadership. The Greek word for elder is presbyteros. Baptists got their name because they have always emphasized the importance of believers' baptism, okay, water baptism. Each denomination has a slightly different doctrine or emphasis from others, such as the method of baptism, the availability of the Lord's Supper to all, or just those whose testimonies can be verified by church leaders, the sovereignty of God versus free will in the matter of salvation, the future of Israel and the church, pre-tribulation versus post-tribulation, the existence of the signs, gifts in the modern era, and so on. So there's all these different denominations that have popped up. And during this time, that's when all of this began uh, rolling. I don't know if you guys grew up in a denominational church. I did not grow up in a denomination. Uh, we, were, uh, we called ourselves Baptists, but we were not in a denomination. We were a fellowship of other churches, okay? And so I'm not sure about you guys, but I think that some of the denominations do some things really, really well, and then sometimes they don't. And so it's interesting, as the development of the country happened, these denominations uh, developed. And so I want to give you an idea here. Diversity is a good thing, but division is not. If two churches disagree doctrinally, we can debate and dialogue over the Word, and that may be called for in Proverbs uh, 27, 17. It talks about iron as iron sharpens iron, so person, a person sharpens another. And so sometimes when there's doctrinal differences, it's good to be able to talk about those things in reason and in grace and in love 
and in truth reason those things between churches. And there's even some churches that have doctrinal beliefs that in some people in the church hold those things. They come from a background and some doesn't. And so they have to agree on the major things. Okay, And so they agree with those things. And sometimes there's some doctrinal differences, but people work on them together. Okay, And so it's beneficial to do that. And if they disagree on style and form, that's okay. But it's, it's one of those things where if we are, we have the denominations, the separation of churches, it's also very helpful that we understand that we can be different and diverse, but it's not okay to be uh, divided, okay? And so those, this separation happens. It does not lift the responsibility to love one another. And we see this all throughout. First John talks about the love for the brethren and ultimately to be united as one in Christ. And I want to close with this. This verse is Jesus in His last time on earth. He uses His last time with His disciples to pray for them. Now we think of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we see that, that, I, that we all have heard many times. But that's actually Him teaching us how to pray. Our Lord actually prays Himself. And in John 17, it's called the High Priestly Prayer. Jesus is our High Priest. And in this High Priestly Prayer, Jesus does a lot, but I want to just, he prays for a lot, and it's really significant doctrinally. But as his disciples are shaking, they know that the hour has come, and Judas has gone to betray him, and they know that his time is coming. He says something very significant in John 17. 21, verses 21 and 22, he says that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, in I and you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. This is an important part of this prayer, this high priestly prayer that Jesus prays for us. He does not pray for our denominations. <laughs> He doesn't pray for specific doctrinal things. He prays for His church to be unified at one in its mission, in its love, and in its energy that is spent to do those things. He says that they, they pray for them to be one. And I want to just really think, want you to think about this for a second. Are you unified to Jesus Christ as one? I know some kids... My kids, when they're little, they think, Jesus, I ask Jesus to come into my heart, and there's, some, there's truth to that. He says, I'll make your heart my home in John 14. He says, I'll come in. He says, I'll be with you. Uh, Jesus also asks several people whether he's worth it or not, whether he's worthy for them to, to lay down their life and what they're doing, not to die like physically, but to die in ways where they lay down their will and pick up their cross and follow him. And he asks them if, they're, if it's worth it. And here as he prays for his disciples, he says, as he's about to lay down his life on the cross for us, he prays that they are together, that they are one, and they experience, get this, they experience the same unity that he experiences with God the Father being a person of the Trinity. And he prays that for his disciples, and he prays that in a way that empowers them. And even though there's doubt of what's going to happen and they're scared, he prays for unity. And so today as we talk about just reason, reasoning logical situations and our faith not just being faith and a blind faith but a reasonable faith and we see that people in the revival time got away from this this reasonable faith and humanism cre creeps in and they think they're the center of the universe and then at this latter period with independence from britain and the rise of denominations you know what continues is the church is the church that has may have different names may have less people that come but the church continues to be the church it continues to prevail throughout uh, all this time period in history. I mean, we're up to the 1700s, and it just continues to prevail. It doesn't go away because the church is Christ's church. He is the one that's in charge of it. He is the one that is sustaining it and making it prevail. And so I want to ask you very clearly, are you a member of Christ's church? Not a member of the Rock Church. Not a member of the church you grew up in. Have you been born again, have you been saved by grace through faith in Christ alone for salvation? 
to be a new creation. Old things pass away, the new things come to be a new creation, be part of the body of Christ. It's exciting to be a part of the body of Christ. And next week when you talk about missions, and the, the great things is the gospel is sent from this country into different countries. All these churches kind of come together, even though they're in denominations, they come together and send people. Are you a part of the body of Christ? Are you a part of the people of God I've been saved by grace, through faith, by Christ Jesus, on mission for Him, living your lives in accordance with Scripture? If not, I'm going to pray a prayer in just a moment. And I'd like you to join with me as we pray that if you want to become a believer, if you want to become a part of the family of God, we're going to pray a prayer and then I'll have a uh, so just some time that we're going to have some next steps and Billy's going to come back out and give you some next steps about that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are so grateful for your word, even through the age of reason, skepticism, people saying that we can't see God, so therefore he doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Lord, you continue to work in the heart of the church. You continue to work in your people. And when people lost interest when they kind of just treated church as a transactional thing as as opposed to a spiritual relational thing you continue to work you brought the revival the, the great awakening god in a in a fight and in independence from a from tyranny from a country so many people are still being dominated by the tyranny of sin and god i want to lift up those that are here tonight that want to receive Jesus Christ as Lord, Lord and Savior. Believe in their hearts that, uh, that you are God. And so if you're here tonight, just pray a quick prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love. Please forgive me of my sin. I know that my salvation is by grace and I receive by faith the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Lord, cleanse my heart. Make me a new creation spiritually by the power of the Holy Spirit. Forgive my sin. Make me your follower the rest of the days of my life. God, we're so grateful for your love. We're so grateful for your grace. And we're so grateful that we are united and that you pray for us before you go to the cross. You pray for your disciples. Lord, I pray that we would understand that prayer, and Lord, that we would be united and we would be one, united in Christ as you are one with the Father. And it's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.